Dr. Oberlander is a developmental pediatrician, uh, physician scientist, and his work bridges developmental neurosciences and community child health. And so he's a clinician, uh, but he's also a researcher, and uh, he works at the BC, Children, uh, BC Children's Research Institute. And uh, he has a really interesting work developing what they call a living lab at home, which I'm hoping we will hear. Oh, yes, there's going to hear much more about in this talk. So I will turn things over to Dr. Oberlander. Great. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I am really thrilled to be here. And I presume I just click on the slides and they magically appear. Oh, I can also use this. I guess I'm in computing science. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm, uh, I have a, um, it's a real privilege to be here. It's, it's actually wonderful to be here in person. It's nice to be back, back on campus. I have a chance to meet Unma, who I've collaborated with for uh, about two years. And now we've finally met, <laughs> not just the virtual Tim. Uh, I, st I stand here really on the shoulders of a very large and um, uh, uh, wonderful collaborative team. Um, but I just want to say, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm here because of the uh, of the connection that Lisa Holste made to get me here in DFP, connected with uh, Pal and uh, Karen and Tamara and uh, and the whole whole community here. And I'm grateful to you for for doing that. So let's get started. Arrow. Oh, okay. That's great. Uh, um, uh, so as I was saying, I, I really stand here on the shoulders of, of many others. And I just want to acknowledge as while I've listed members of our team that went into much of this data, subsequent to that, the work of Jane Shen, who's here with us is, uh, I also acknowledge because the uh, work that um, uh, ultimately allowed us to move and make progress here was because of her uh, of her data uh, creativity and skills. Uh, to start with, I also would like to acknowledge that uh, I work and live and have the privilege of being here on the traditional and ancestral unceded territories of the Squamish, Squamish Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and I'm grateful for the beauty around us, and I, I live it every day. So. Today's tasks are really to describe the Living Lab project and review what we've learned uh, from parents and their children uh, about the Living Lab-based research platform, and finally to describe uh, data visualization that can become a, that has become an integral part of the Living Lab data collection process. This talk uh, in this next hour is divided up between uh, introductory comments that I'm going to make about the Living Lab concept. Uh, then uh, Caitlin Berner, who's a, a clinical psychologist, scientist, uh, postdoc student, will talk about um, a second part of, of the work we've done, uh, learning from parents and their children. And the third part that Unma Desai will talk about the data visualization work. And each one of them will say a few introductory words about themselves. Um, and uh, so um, this story, uh, began in uh, early 2020. Uh, so I'm a, a, I spent years studying early brain development in children and uh, of mothers who were depressed during pregnancy. And I've recruited a longitudinal cohort dating back into 2002 or 2003. And uh, it was all lab-based uh, research. Uh, it involved uh, every few years bringing families back into the lab doing some computer-based tasks some paper and pencil tasks and then COVID hit and I was stuck not only was I stuck clinically but I was stuck as a researcher because we couldn't bring anybody back into the lab and I didn't see any way going forward that this would end anytime soon and my the cohort I was studying was aging rapidly well they were aging no more than what you and I were aging, but but my ability to bring them back and study them was aging. And CIHR had just turned me down 
to do a uh, EEG based uh, study at 15 years of age. So I was stuck. I had no money. The cohort was aging and I know I needed a study. So I turned around and, you know, my view of life is to turn adversity into opportunity. And sure enough, I was actually doing the wrong thing for 15 years. I should have been going out to the community, going out to the bedside, the backyard, not to the bench or the lab. And in fact, the opportunity uh, uh, presented itself very rapidly that it was time to pivot and see what I could do in the community. It turns out that you can do a whole lot of really cool things by gathering data in everyday settings, which I couldn't do in the lab. Here I've illustrated a number of these uh, in the following slide, where COVID really forced us to rethink our approach to data collection. So on the Left-hand side, you can see the typical lab data collection is in person, it's in a clinic or a lab, it's point of time, it's measurement, and it's all subject to memory recall bias because we're saying that at that moment of time, we want to know how you're feeling, thinking, acting as if to suggest that at two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, it's as good as every Tuesday for a given month. Well, it turns out that's you know, that Tuesday at two o'clock is only telling us about Tuesday at two o'clock. And then, of course, we were using uh, questionnaires that were of questionable ecological validity. So we were using measures like the Spielberger anxiety scale. Okay, that's great. It was validated and set up by Spielberger to measure anxiety as if that's a property that we can quantify and all agree on. Well, maybe in a certain constraints, it is okay. But we actually don't know whether our children were actually anxious or not. So our measures were probably not tapping into what, what really was lived experience. And it turns out lived experience is probably much more important than my investigator invented concepts of, oh, I want to know about anxiety and depression. And well, is that really what's relevant to the families? And so in pivoting towards a living lab at home platform for data collection, we began to start thinking about what an ambulatory data collection platform would look like, what real-time micro longitudinal studies would look like, and what data collection meant in the context of where families lived everyday lives. Now, you'd think this was a novel concept. Well, it's actually, for me, it was, it was a learning experience because this involved uh, thinking about how data could be collected in a non-lab, in non-constrained, non-confined, non-predictable way. So what we began to realize, of course, was the Living Lab platform uh, could ask uh, real world questions about mood, symptoms, activity, and daily function over long periods of time beyond just two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Living Labs, of course, have been widely applied in adult health research, but little attention up to this point had been uh, given to uh, children's health, but more importantly, children's health across a developmental spectrum. So children with developmental disabilities, either physical, behavioral, and general metabolic uh, disorders that would lead to impairments in cognition, uh, motor function, and uh, social interaction. The Living Lab concept uh, allowed us to bring uh, technology, digital technology to a multimodal uh, venue whereby we could use wearables, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, to gather everyday data. So, for the focus of this proof of principle concept, how do we get the living lab up and running? We focused on smartphone based uh, questionnaire data, uh, celebrate biomarkers and um, accelerometers. And the aim of this, uh, of this first phase of the living lab was to develop a platform of in-home research methods that could be flexibly adapted to children's needs, family needs, family context across a wide range of developmental abilities. Uh, we, uh, we developed the living lab uh, with an iterative human-centered co-designed model. So we, we knew that uh, if we were gonna make this thing work in an in-home setting, we would need to make sure that the families uh, could give us feedback about what was both ethical, logistical, uh, privacy uh, related concerns. We, um, started by uh, collecting feedback from key stakeholders, both families, uh, children, and uh, investigators that included a uh, uh, wide variety of different uh, clinical uh, settings uh, across the developmental spectrum. And Caitlin will talk about that in a moment. Uh, and this included the stakeholder focus groups uh, and 
uh, uh, these are the data that Caitlin will, will present in the next few slides. And I'm going to now hand, hand it over to Caitlin and I'll come back at the end uh, for questions. Thank you. She's in the waiting room, yeah. You want me to call on him? It's the wrong. You want me to call? You want to call? She's not here. So, what nightmare carry on? Oh, uh, oh, well. she's, oh, no, she's here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's here. Uh, would she have seen the first part of what I said? Yeah. Okay, uh, Caitlin, welcome to Hi. DFP lunch rounds. Uh, I've taken sorry. I, I, sorry I, for I, being late. I was sitting on in the waiting room for on a different Zoom link, so I did not see anything until now. So I've take I've taken the story up to the uh, phase one, iterative human designed uh, stakeholder feedback. Take it away, Caitlin. Sure. So um, in this. Uh, First phase, um, we were really interested in taking a patient engagement perspective around helping to co-design the living lab at home methods. So um, we did interviews with families uh, who represented different um, levels of uh, development, communication, motor, and cognitive ability. And um, these families um, represented a variety of different um, medical, psychiatric, and developmental conditions. And we also uh, conducted focus groups with clinicians, researchers, and research administrators. And the, the intent of both the interviews and the focus groups was to um, collect perspectives on the use of in-home research and what types of research questions we should be focusing on, but also what modifications would be needed um, to make this approach to research accessible for all of these different populations and the different populations that our, our groups of clinicians and researchers serve. Next slide, please. So th these were the three themes um, that uh, came out of the interviews that we conducted with um, families and uh, other stakeholders. The first was something that we probably could have expected, which was um, a need for flexibility in how this research was designed and conducted. Um, this was definitely something that we were anticipating hearing about from families, but the part that was really interesting um, was getting some really specific feedback from families about what types of flexibility would make the biggest difference for them in being able to uh, take part in this research. So we talked about flexibility around timing, um, of different uh, of the different expectations for participants um, within the study, um, who data was being collected from, and how um, a lot of families, particularly those who um, had children or youth with um, autism or severe neurologic impairment, talked about the sensory look or feel of the devices. So, if a child was going to be wearing a, a wearable, to have options around um, the sensory aspects of that. Um, thinking about how to make uh, all of our methods really trauma informed and appreciating that for some families um, being asked questions repeatedly throughout the day or being asked to do research related tasks would serve as a reminder of things that were challenging for them. And so we got some feedback from families about how to um, approach that sensitively. Thinking about different ability levels, the different settings that uh, children and youth find themselves in throughout the day. And if we're thinking about in-home research, it also has to be adaptable to be in school research and, um, and all of the other places that kids spend their time. And then also flexibility around reminders. And this is where um, lots of families had different uh, preferences around what would be helpful for them in making sure that they got the tasks completed. 
Families also talked about wanting a reciprocal relationship with the research team. So um, some of the families who took part in, in these interviews had um, participated in research before and talked about their data sort of going off into a void so that they would uh, take part in the research study, they would send off all of this data, and then they would never hear from the research team again. So um, Families were really keen on the idea of being able to access their own data uh, throughout the study and also to have access to it after is something that they might use just for their own understanding of themselves or their child, but also is something that they might be able to share with um, clinical care providers. Families also wanted to be involved in helping with priority setting and determining what research questions were the most important to them or would have the biggest impact on them. Um, families wanted to be involved in discussions around how the methods were set up with respect to their privacy concerns, especially since data was going to be collected sort of in the spaces that they were living. Lots of families talked about how um, compensation for research was was nice, but the actual amount um, wasn't really uh, of the biggest concern to them, but that they would want something back from the research team that acknowledged their uh, their contributions to the research. And some families talked about both um, as a positive in-home research and a negative, that the sense of community uh, with other families who were having similar experiences um, was something that they really valued. And some were worried that that would be lost by doing in-home research, that they might not have that same sense of community, but others felt like it was an opportunity that would allow them them to potentially connect with others um, or know that they weren't alone in their experience just by virtue of, of taking part in a research study. And then finally, this um, came out the most from our interviews of families of youth with severe neurologic impairment. Um, they really saw the, these adaptations to in-home research as being an opportunity uh, for them to take part in research where maybe they wouldn't have um, been able to before because of the, the different um, challenges and things that they're working around, they might not have been able to, you know, come in person to do a research study. Um, or it might be that other research studies that they've heard about in the past didn't have methods that were accessible for their child's unique motor communication and cognitive or emotional needs. And so uh, families were quite keen about this, um, this aspect of the research, you know, sort of being something that they could both um, participate in, but also benefit from that uh, these families often talked about not see, being able to see their child represented in the types of, of health research that's going on. And so they can't benefit from the findings because there aren't children uh, like their child that are able to take part in research. So there was, again, sort of this um, flavor of a, a reciprocal relationship there. And families really talked about the ecological logical validity being much better um, if they were able to do in-home research, as they said, you know, getting a, a one-time snapshot of their child's behavior within a clinical or, um, you know, university research lab environment was just not going to capture sort of the nuance and complexity of their day-to-day -day experience. Next slide, please. So, this was all really useful information and what we tried to do in the second phase of this living lab at home project was to take what we had learned from this engagement with stakeholders and incorporate it into some pilot demonstration projects. And here we're really interested in trying to find a balance between how much can we accommodate the preferences and uh, requests of families for things to be done in a more accessible, um, you know, family-friendly way and, and developmentally friendly way. How can we balance that with also the need to collect data that is valid and usable? And how much can we sort of stretch the parameters of data collection to be able to accommodate what families need while still getting data that we can make sense of and draw conclusions from. So uh, these pilot studies were really intended to test out some of the, the feedback that families had given us to see, does it make a difference when we implement this feedback? And, um, and how are families experiencing the study um, with these adaptations? Are there things that we need to change again? Can we kind of continue to iterate on these methods um, by getting more feedback from families as they're actually doing it? So what we had families do was test out three of the living lab at home methods that we had focused on, the wearable accelerometers for activity monitoring, the smartphone ecological momentary assessment, which was three times a day asking questions about symptoms, experiences, and, um, and social interactions, and then three times a day saliva collection to look at salivary cortisol. And here we're really interested in feasibility of these methods. So at this point, we're not actually interested in analyzing the data that participants are providing to look at relationships between all of these different measures, although that's the ultimate goal. Um, 
we're interested in looking at, you know, how often are families able to actually fill out these questionnaires? What are the things that got in the way of them being able to participate? Did they wear the accelerometer for the entire study duration? Did anything go wrong in terms of the, you know, the technical deployment of this? And, um, and so we're collecting sort of that data quality um, throughout the study period, which was 14 days. And then at the end of the 14 days, we asked families to take part in a brief interview where we talked about their experiences and, and what adaptations helped and what we could uh, continue to improve on in the future. Next slide, please. And so the, the stage that we're at now is uh, looking at this feasibility and acceptability data that we've collected. And um, this is just a very um, brief representation of what some of that data looks like. So um, with the uh, ecological momentary assessment data, you see the, in the pink graph on the bottom, um, you know, this these are ratings that um, that. Uh, participant provided around their happiness across the 14 days at each of the three time points a day that they filled out. And um, so just by looking at some of this data, we're able to get a sense of sort of the variability in the data, but also what if there were any gaps, if there were any time points that were missed. Um, and then you can also see above, this is some of the data that we get from the accelerometers, which is much more fine grained than um, than the ecological momentary assessment data because that's happening uh, you know, continuously throughout the day. But part of what we're interested in doing is um, sort of looking at the quality of the data that we've received, um, seeing whether some of the adaptations we've made around you know, like where the wearable is positioned on the body or what type of strap was used for sensory reasons, um, how much of a, that, a difference that seems to make in the data, and starting to construct some preliminary statistical models so that we have um, a sense of how we might use this data uh, when we're actually deploying this in a real study. Um, so there's a couple of different layers to what we're looking at here with the, the data collected itself. And then we're also um, looking at these feasibility and acceptability outcomes from the interviews with uh, patients and families. Next slide, please. And so um, to kind of carry on from this, we've been thinking about, you know, not only how can we use all of this information to help refine our methods, but how can we sort of think even further uh, to build on that, that second theme that um, we think is so critical around um, making sure that there's this reciprocal relationship with the patients and families and so that they can um, benefit from accessing their own data. This was pretty consistently across families, something that they were really interested in. Some families were more interested in the idea of having um, access to their own personal data. Some were more interested in accessing data from the entire study, which is a little bit more standard practice, I think, to share overall research results with families. But uh, generally, there was quite a bit of interest in this, particularly given the nature of the data that's collected, which is multimodal and over the course of, of um, two weeks, which can really allow kind of more of an in-depth understanding of um, your experiences and your health condition. So We've taken this idea and um, have looked specifically at the population of, of children and youth with chronic pain. Um, Tim and I work with this population clinically and um, are very aware of how um, you know, access to your own data could really change your experience and understanding of a condition like chronic pain, which is a really complex and costly condition um, where there's a lot of fluctuation in individual experiences. So youth with chronic pain um, often have pain that changes over the course of the day, over the course of an hour, and that can be associated with a number of different um, the triggers and relievers. And it's often really hard for patients and families to make sense of what is making their pain worse, what's making their pain better, and how that's interacting with things like emotions or other physical symptoms or sleep, because it's just so much data and it's constantly changing. So um, we really saw youth with chronic pain as being a perfect um, a perfect test case for looking at the impact of being able to access and interact with your own data. And, um, you know, we have this statement here around the fact that chronic pain is essentially a self-appraisal condition um, because the real adage within the chronic pain community is that pain is whatever the patient says it is. So what is a, you know, six out of 10 to one person might be a 10 out of 10 to somebody else and a one out of 10 to a third person. So, you know, we're really um, 
when we're looking at assessing chronic pain, it's really about the subjective experience of the person who is having it. There's no biomarker that can tell us uh, the, the pain experience of an individual person. But the problem is with a self-appraisal condition like that, um, it can be really shaped and impacted by your attention, how much you're paying attention to the pain that you're having in any given moment, your interpretation of that pain, what does it mean to you, where do you think it's coming from, and also your memory. So we tend to be bias towards remembering uh, the worst and the most recent pain that we've had. Uh, and that's a real kind of protective mechanism. But it's also something that can make it very hard for a patient to say, yes, my pain has been uh, moderate over the last few weeks, or my pain has been severe, because their, their memory and their understanding of that pain is a very individual experience. And it's also constantly fluctuating. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, similar to what I was saying on the last slide, you know, this is a self-appraisal condition. So it's like kind of the ideal setting in which to look at um, how does one interact with their own data about their pain and use that to make sense of their experiences. Um, multimodal data collection becomes really important here, not just multimodal in terms of the actual modalities in which we're collecting data, but also the sort of the constructs that we're tapping into because pain is is much more than just a physical sensation. There's an emotional aspect to it. There's a functional aspect to it. Um, and it impacts uh, pretty much every um every aspect of day-to-day day -day living when you have uh, complex pain. And it's also best understood within a real world setting because of this fluctuating nature of it. And because that really is where children and youth are spending their time. So um, the, uh, you know, having to transition to virtual care within the COVID-19 pandemic has also really highlighted for us the really urgent need for more virtual approaches to incorporating that patient-oriented perspective and for us to have more virtual options for collecting data about patients' daily experiences that we can then uh, use to make some clinical decisions and also support the youth in their own self-management. So the question that we really asked through this is, you know, how can we harness what we've learned from the living lab to be able to address this problem? And what would it be like for, for patients and families if they could see their pain? So pictures of their pain um, depicted through visualized data of their own self-reported measures of things like pain and anxiety and physical symptoms to see patterns of their own lived experience and draw uh, conclusions from that. So I think at this point, I'm now going to hand it over um, to Unma to talk about uh, the next phase of, of that work. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about the design of the visualizations um, and the application and a bit more about the feedback we got from the youth. Um, so what we did was we kind of designed the My Week Inside application, which is kind of this patient-centered application that uses a combination of the EMA survey approach uh, that Caitlin um, kind of spoke about, and also combines them with visualizations of the EMA collected data. Um, and so basically patients kind of fill out the survey, they're able to see the visualizations. And so it's kind of comes full circle. And it also takes up um, data from multiple aspects of the patient's life. So relationships, school, pain, mental health, sleep, we gather data about all of these things. And that um, the application also kind of provides a platform for the patient to share this real-time data with the clinicians. Um, so the visualizations we designed for the data, um, it's kind of presented to the patients in a long vertical form, um, kind of broken down here just to show the visualizations. And then we developed this in collaboration with the clinicians, um, HCI and visualization experts, and also took feedback from youth with chronic pain and patient partners. Um, and so what we got were a set of like vertically aligned color-coded graphs that show sleep, pain, emotions, mental health, and then social interactions. Um, so for instance, like the sleep here, you have like a range chart that shows uh, the time they went to sleep, the time they woke up, and then the quality of their sleep. Um, and then for symptoms, we kind of show what intensity of symptoms they had, um, which symptoms they had and when they occurred. Uh, for emotions, we have a line graph that shows how their emotions trended over the week with different emotions like happiness, worries, anger. And then we also show their mental health. So how worried they were about things, what are the things that worry them um, and how bad do they think 
things are going to be versus how bad things actually are. And then at the end in purple, there's your social relationship. So, you know, did you go to school? How were your interactions with your friends and how worried were you about those interactions? So overall kind of capturing um, the holistic picture of their patient's daily lived experiences. And then we deployed these visualizations by partnering with the health tech firm care team, um, deployed these visualizations on their platform, um, through which we also had the surveys, which are filled out three times a day by the patients. Um, and then we then conducted a clinical feasibility trial with 50 uterine chronic pain, um, where we had an AB condition. So either um, patients, uh, participants got um, a survey and visualization for one week, followed by a seven day break, followed by a week of just the surveys, or uh, they had just the surveys for a week, followed by a seven day break, followed by the surveys and the visualizations. And this was basically just so we could kind of see what their experience was with the visualizations versus just data collection. And then post that, okay, uh, the study results have disappeared. Um, we had, Study outcomes on the slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we conducted interviews with a subset of the participants, so with 10 uterine chronic pain who went through the entire three-week period. Uh, we conducted interviews to ask them what their experience was with the utility um, and the use of the application, what they thought about the design of the visualizations, and what else they would like to do to continue use. Um, yeah, so overall, uh, regarding the utility, um, participants said that they kind of liked the application. They found um, insights that they didn't know about their own behavior. They um, found out new things about themselves, and they were also motivated to change their behavior, change certain patterns in their life, like getting better sleep or worrying less, and the visualizations kind of helped them see that. Um, for continued use, nine out of uh, the 10 participants we spoke to said they would want to continue use of the application, um, saying that it was useful to track their information and seeing the visualizations help them learn cool stuff about themselves that they otherwise wouldn't have known. So they would like to continue using it for that. Um, some also mentioned how even though they were comfortable with seeing their own pain, um, it could be a trigger to other people. So it's still kind of a subjective thing. Um, and then for the design of the visualizations, most of the participants liked the designs, um, but some of them found certain ones more relevant than others. Um, the sleep and the pain charts were particularly interesting for a majority of our participants. Um, and a lot of them felt that maybe mental health and social interactions were not things that they would like to track on a daily basis. Um, overall, they liked the designs. Overall, the bar charts and the range charts, the ones that we used that were familiar and easier to understand were liked. Um, and they also found that seeing multiple charts next to each other allowed them to um, see connections between different aspects of their life, like how their mental health was connected to their sleep. Um, and then participants also mentioned things that they would want to add or um, other features that they would like to see, for instance, changing uh, the frequency of the EMA surveys, like having them more or less frequently. Um, as well as visualizations, only seeing the ones that were most relevant to them. Like, for instance, if they were only interested in seeing their sleep and pain, those were just the ones they wanted to track. Um, and then some also mentioned how they would want to track additional data. So for instance, physical data or menstrual cycles, they would also want to have that kind of data recorded. Um, yeah, and then I think I'll hand it over to Caitlin to speak about the feasibility results. Thanks, Unma. So Unma's interviews really looked more in depth at the visualizations themselves and um, to, to zoom back out again and look at kind of the, the feasibility results from the broader study. Um, this was a study 
of uh, neurotypical youth, but our, um, the next step that we're planning for is to um, look at sort of the design and deployment specific to youth with autism to see how, um, you know, some of their uh, unique social and uh, emotional and communication needs can be best met through this platform. But for this study specifically, uh, looking at neurotypical youth, we found that um, recruiting our desired sample and keeping them in the study were both highly feasible in a really short time span, we uh, were able to do this feasibility study in less than three months during a kind of suboptimal time of the year for recruiting adolescents. We were um, just with uh, timing around getting everything um, approved and ready to go. We ended up recruiting uh, around uh, sort of the end of the school year, beginning of summer, which is a notoriously difficult time to engage adolescents in doing much of anything. But um, I think the fact that we were able to recruit and retain the numbers that we did really speaks to the level of interest in, um, in accessing this type of platform for youth with chronic pain. Uh, we were able to recruit quite a diverse sample with respect to sex, gender identity, ethnicity, and the type of chronic pain that youth were experiencing. Um, overall, we had a pretty good response rate to the EMA questionnaires. So youth were pretty good about uh, filling out these questionnaires pretty regularly. And this is pretty much in line with what uh, other studies that have used this methodology of asking youth to fill out surveys a couple of times a day on a smartphone. Um, we tend to see, um, you know, sort of 70 to 80 percent uh, response rates. So um, that was in line with what we were expecting. Um, and you do tend to see, because we were asking them to fill it out three times a day, um, there's a kind of a predictable dip in um, in response rates in the afternoons for youth when they are still in school, because um, yeah, not all of them have access to their phones. So that was somewhat expected. Uh, we did have some technical issues with um, some of the EMA responses not saving correctly, and so um, that's something that we're looking to address in uh, future iterations of this platform. And it's possible that for those responses that weren't um, that that were subject to some of those technical issues, it may have impacted the visualizations that they viewed. Just that it might have um, not all of the data might have made its way into the visualizations. And then we asked youth. Um, you know, whether or not they actually looked at the visualizations uh, during the week that they should have had access to them. And not all of them did. And the feedback around that was kind of interesting. Uh, for, I would say, the majority of youth, the issue was primarily around having difficulty navigating the platform and finding the visualizations. So that's something that we definitely um, will need to address in subsequent iterations. Um, and for some youth, they did actually say that they just weren't interested or they didn't think it would be helpful to look at the visualizations, which again speaks to the, the fact that there's some different needs and preferences within the population. Um, of those who did view the visualization, most found uh, it interesting and useful, kind of in, in line with what Uma found in her more in-depth interviews with a subset of the sample. And they often offered some helpful suggestions for improvements. And one of the really important things that we measured as part of this feasibility study was adverse events, because um, this was really meant to provide us some pilot data and feasibility data to inform a larger scale clinical trial of uh, the use of this platform as a means of uh, promoting uh, self-management behaviors in youth with chronic pain, but also potentially to supplement some existing treatments that youth are engaged in. And, uh, and so part of, you know, uh, informing whether we should move on to a larger scale trial was looking at whether there were any adverse events associated with study participation. And what we found is that generally adverse events were very rare and uh, were not necessarily related to the visualizations. It was most often that youth would say they would report distress and then it would sort of be related to other things that were going on in their lives, perhaps compounded by um, the additional demands of participating in the study. But uh, there were not any adverse events related to having viewed something in the visualizations that was determined to be distressing to them. So overall, I think we have some good data to help um, us move on to a larger scale trial and then also into looking at adapting this for some different populations, um, as I said, starting with youth with autism and uh, continuing to take sort of this patient engaged co-design approach. And I think we're uh, over to Tim for the for our wrap up here. So we've uh, presented uh, the general concept of the Living Lab. 
presented what it took to get there because we realized that we had to do an enormous amount of feasibility proof of principle work. And then we illustrated what we could get out of the living lab using the EMA pain study. We now have, uh, we're now at a point where we've got a uh, prototype for a website, which should invite investigators and interested clinicians to come and learn more about this, engage with us about adapting this to their particular research. And that's already beginning to happen. And part of our uh, presence here today is to spread the word and uh, join us uh, with your cool ideas that, uh, that might help accelerate uh, this uh, living lab platform for in-home data collection. Thanks very much. Yay! I'm applauding. I can't hear if anyone else. I'm sure everyone else is applauding in the room there, Tim. I can't hear them, but I'm sure it's a big round of applause. Great. Um, so it's my pleasure to try and do a little bit of um, facilitating the questions to you and your uh, team of um, presenters, Tim. Uh, so uh, if anyone has a question, they can please come up to the mic. Uh, yeah, there's a mic there. There's no one there yet. <laughs> so if people could come up to the mic to ask the questions, that would be great. In the meantime, though, we do have some questions in the chat. So maybe I'll start with a chat question. And I will go with the first one from, uh, I'm not sure, uh, Ian or Jan. I'm not sure. You can correct me. Dinstein? Dinstein? Yeah, it's, it's Ilan Dinstein. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Did you Hi. want to just say your question, Ilan? Sure. So, um, so hi Tim, and and thanks for and Caitlin and Uma for for the great presentation. I, I was wondering if you could give a, a few more details about the actigraphy and how well the participants accepted them, and and whether there were any issues on that, you know, on the digital phenotyping end of of the thing of what you're doing. Yeah, I'll get I'll start, and then uh, Caitlin can can join me. Um, so uh, while this turned well, it started as a relatively easy question. Can we get data about uh, activity, sedentary time, sleep, and maybe even some screen time for our participants? Turns out to be technically much more difficult using the device that we we uh, we used. So you can you can go to you know Best Buy and buy um, uh, Fitbits, and that gives you some data. But that data is warehoused in the states, and then accessing that for uh, this type of research is uh, both technically, privacy, security-wise, challenging. We wanted to have uh, something that was uh, going to give us fine-grained data that we could access and use here in Vancouver in our lab. Um, so that and that actually turns out to be that that's technically easy to acquire data, but data processing has turned out to be much more difficult, and that has to do with the sort of homegrown community of data processors who have got their own uh, particular uh, approach to data reduction. We're working with Louise Mass and her group uh, at Children's Hospital to, to work on a data reduction approach. There are technical issues which we're trying to sort out right now with R. Uh, so there's a technical issue there. The second is uh, a more practical question, which is um, where is the wearable most wearable and comfortable and going to give us reliable data. So the wearables we're using cannot be used in the shower. I, I think they, they don't know, they're not waterproof. Caitlin, correct me if I'm wrong. That's um, correct, yeah. Well, uh, they're, so they're waterproof to an extent. <laughs> but it's not, they're not submergible. No. Uh, the second issue is if we're working with uh, individuals who have uh, skin sensitivity issues, then wearing it on a wrist uh, can become a problem. So then we thought, okay, well, well, we'll move that to the waist and then we'll try to maybe put the wearable into a neoprene coat, you know, uh, sleeves, which would have to custom make. Is it possible to do that? Yes, we've, we've got some. Um, and then most recently we've had uh, one other complication uh, that one of the participants in another study actually threw the uh, wearable away like they thought, okay, the, the study's over. I'm just now going to throw it away. So there we, we lost a $280 wearable. Caitlin, what, what are the other complications we've come across? 
Yeah, so I mean, in the Living Lab pilot study, we did give people the option of opting out of uh, the of any aspect of the study. And interestingly, the only aspect of the study that folks chose to opt out of was um, the saliva samples. So no one opted out of the accelerometer. Um, there were a couple who chose to wear it on the waist versus the wrist. And um, like Tim said, we're still exploring some other options for what that can look like. Um, but uh, interestingly, the the issue that was often raised by families around compliance with wearing the activity activity device was less around sensory issues, which is what we had been expecting, and more around um, social issues and uh, not wanting others to see that they're wearing the device or um, feeling like it didn't look uh, didn't look cool or they would prefer to be wearing their own device, so, which raises another question of whether there's ways in the future to perhaps um, uh, access data through devices that participants are already owned and, and they're using. Um, because you know, as someone who who piloted the actigraphy device, um, I didn't find it particularly comfortable, and I can totally see how a teenager would not be keen to wear this like rather clunky looking device on their body. So I think the fact that there were there's the alternative options of the pouch or the waist um, was definitely helpful for for some participants, and uh, and and I think that um, you know we're, we're we're trying to figure out within that realm of flexibility also how much variability we can have in um, some participants wearing it in some ways and not in others and still get data that we can aggregate in a in a meaningful way. Thank you so much. That's a very uh, detailed answer to Ian's uh, question or Elan's questions. Um, so. Um, I'm not sure, does, is there anyone else in the room who has a question? I don't see anyone coming up to that table. Oh, oh someone's coming up. Hey, Ben. Um, All right. Yeah, so I, I had a question. Right at the end, you talked about uh, how you envision this being a platform for other researchers. I'm just wondering if you could comment on what capabilities you would be offering and uh, how you would imagine such a relationship happening. Yeah, absolutely. So we chose three modalities just as a way of getting started, but you can imagine that there's many other uh, opportunities here for uh, portable EEG, uh, EKG, um, sleep studies, uh, video, uh, in-home video, if we can sort out the privacy and security issues. Um, uh, Hal has suggested a sound-based uh, data collection uh, approach uh, that he uh, came up with the idea about uh, like the smart watch that allows you to measure uh, real time, uh, both conversation, but also sounds in the home. Um, so the, 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 uh, the sky's the limit of what we could, you know, what you can collect. I think the real question is not just what you can collect, but how can you make sense of the data? And our, our challenge, uh, which I think um, Caitlin and Uma uh, alluded to, which was, not just can we collect a single modality, but can we begin to look at multi-level modeling that allows us to look at relationships between different phenomena, which we wouldn't normally see if we were just looking at uh, longitudinal data around, you know, worry or anxiety. And uh, that's uh, that's going to be the challenge. Is, is going to be the analytic approach that we took. We, we need to take to put the model of what living life looks like. And um, the uh, the key part is not just behavioral data, but how do you integrate um, wearable data and bio data. So we, we didn't get into the salivary cortisol question, but salivary saliva can yield many, many biomarkers. And we just chose cortisol as one stress measure. But um, uh, that, you know, you could, you could think about some really complex multidimensional model that, that look at changes in these, uh, in these outcomes over time. So the sky's the limit. And we're open to, uh, to thinking about this. Thanks very yeah. much. And I think when it comes to the collaboration piece, um, something that's already started to happen organically, even though we're at the very beginning stages of this, is that we've been approached by a couple of research teams who have been interested about integrating in-home research methods into their 
um, existing programs of research and, and projects. And what we've been able to provide them is, is some of our preliminary data around some of the adaptations that, uh, that might help to enhance their data collection or make it more feasible or acceptable or get better data quality from their participants. So it's been really interesting for us to um, to, to be thinking about sort of where the need is within our research community um, and uh, and hopefully helping folks so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time with sort of uh, developing and validating all of these different methods, but also so that we can incorporate some of that validation and iteration uh, within some other existing research projects so we can be con continually getting feedback um, as we partner with different research teams and uh, so we can keep updating the methods with all this other information coming in. Um, so hopefully that will, those partnerships will, will continue. Thank you so much. Um, I hope oh, someone coming up for a question. Oh, maybe, no, maybe <laughs> I'm watching the screen. Yeah. Someone's coming. So, uh, so I really like uh, the project and the research that, uh, you continued. I closely observed a lot because we work in the same lab. One of my question is like, how do you expect for this project to scale because right now you looked at like a week inside but if you look at a month inside or a year inside the data like exceeds and then it becomes even difficult to visualize it and then like okay what if I want to check my last year's data on a snapshot and compare it to this year because I'm like yeah this year is not going too well for me health-wise and stuff so how do you uh, how do you think about it right now as a future yeah. That is a that is a superb question, and it can be answered, I think, addressed in a number of ways. One is that there's a philosophic, methodologic issue around how much is too little and how much is too much, and uh, that would be a, a great seminar that I'd love to participate in in thinking about uh, data quantity. Um, and uh, I've worked on little data, a loss of little data, and now I'm working on lots of data at a bigger level. Uh, and then there's also population level data, um, which you can which you can see how this could integrate into this as well. Um, so there's that question that, uh, and I think the answer to uh, how much data is like the Goldilocks and the, the porridge story, because you need to get the, the bowl and temperature and the amount of porridge just right. But that is really governed by, it depends on what question you wanna answer. Because you can get lots of data over long periods of time that may not be quantifiable in a way that's meaningful to the system that you're trying to understand. And so it really depends on context, the question you want to answer, and what's meaningful. And uh, I'm going to have, I'm probably going to have to leave it at those three questions because I don't think there's any more of an answer. And uh, Lisa has introduced me to, uh, uh, to long, long uh, big data uh, of heart rate. And it, that's the, those are the similar questions that we're trying to we're struggling, still struggling with, trying to make sense of lots of lots of uh, longitudinal data. Yeah, thank you. Great, um, Dong Wong. Uh, Dong Wong, uh, how much time do we have? Because I realize we're running up to the hour. Yeah, um, I think um, it's around one p.m. now, so I think uh, maybe we can take just one more question and then um, say this is the end. I had a quick question. It's maybe it's not a quick question, but I was wondering about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So, does measuring pain uh, elicit pain? Is my question, and I was wondering if you could, you maybe as a third arm to your study, if you might consider just measuring pain once. So you randomize people to three groups, measure pain just once and see, compare those three groups and see what happens with pain over time. Yeah, it's a really, it's it's a really good question. And something that we've debated about a, a little bit is, you know, how much does your, uh, also along the lines of like, how much does your behavior change if you know you're being monitored or you're being forced to monitor it? And and also this this tension that we have as pain clinicians, where often the advice that we're giving to, to families um, of children with pain is attend to the pain less, like ask about the pain less, focus more on function, and uh, and then, you know, by asking them to repeatedly provide these measures, in some ways, we're going against our own, uh, you know, clinical advice and intuition. And I think that, um, you know, 
part of a, an interesting opportunity here, which has been discussed a little bit in the uh, adult pain world around this kind of idea of repeated sampling and the impact that that has on pain, um, has been around how the questions are actually phrased and, and the framing of, you know, are you asking about pain and only about things that are negative? Are you asking about function and things that they're, they're actively working on to help support their pain management? And that it might be that, you know, we might be able to mitigate some of the negative impacts of that repeated sampling by how we go about presenting and framing the, the question to them. But I, I like that idea of a third arm to see just the, what is the impact of just asking once and whether uh, whether that repeated monitoring has a different, uh, changes the, the pain trajectory over time. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a really great question. And I'm just building on what Caitlin said. Uh, we have an opportunity here to refocus the conversation to everyday function. And we know that function often improves before symptom reduction occurs. And if we can somehow get uh, the family and, and child to focus on how well things are going uh, and we have data for it, which we now think we have, we can begin to sort of shift the conversation to, uh, to a much more uh, strength-based uh, uh, conversation. Um, I, th I think that it, you're also raising the question about uh, the closer you look to a phenomena, the more uncertainty you are about whether that phenomena is as stable or uh, real as it appears. Is that is that part of your core question? Well, it, it, that... it, Heisenberg basically you talked about how you can't if you want to measure it was about particles and basically yes. you can measure the mass of a particle or its velocity, but you uh, but measuring one affects the other. Uh, so uh, it's basically measure it's all about measurement error in a way. And, and the closer you look, the more granular you get, the more uncertain you are about whether the, the, there's a stable property there, which is true for what we're doing here. So, sure. so we could actually be adding more variance by sampling more frequently, which is exactly what you, I think you're suggesting. And Caitlin, uh, you just given us a great idea about the third arm for the study. Yeah. Well, how exciting. Um, I really should wind things up because I actually have another meeting I'm supposed to be chairing now. Um, <laughs> But I, I love this. This was wonderful. And it's really, um, I work with Lisa and uh, Stephanie Glade. So it's nice to see them um, contribute working with you as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Um,